All right, it's uh, just at the top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody again. My name is Alec Harris and I am president of GIA Publications and it's my incredible pleasure and honor to welcome you to this incredible group of uh, teachers and experiences around Conversational Recorder, which has just been published in the past few months. We have the two authors with us, Rachel Grimsby and doc, uh, Dr. Rachel Grimsby and Dr. John Fyrobin. Uh, uh, just so you know, uh, again, please in, please put into the chat box who you are, where you teach, where you're from, and I'd love to hear from you on the webinar. Uh, we are recording this, so it will be posted later for you to share out to your friends. Uh, we also have a coupon code. If you haven't acquired a uh, conversational recorder yet, and you use the coupon code CRECORDER15, that's CRECORDER, all caps, numbers one and five, you will get a 15% discount on Conversation Recorder from the GIA website. So excited about that. And uh, also, if you haven't used webinar format before, there is a Q&A panel, and we are gonna be reserving the last 15 minutes or so of this webinar for your questions. So we encourage you to ask questions. We will hold them uh, and then ask them at the end. We'll try to get through as many of them as we possibly can. And I'm gonna to try to get out of the way. I just wanna introduce uh, Rachel and John. Rachel Grimsby is Assistant Professor of Music Education at Illinois State University. She's a master teacher with more than 15 years of teaching experience in the classroom and an amazing, uh, amazing music educator. So excited that you've been a part of this project, which has been years in the making. <laughs> and, uh, doc, and then John Feyerabend, which is, uh, uh, probably needs no introduction, author of The First Steps of Music and Conversational Sol, uh, Recorder and Solfege resources that we publish at GIA for many, many years, a master educator uh, and an incredible mind and uh, bright mind. And yes, with the GIA recorder, I see that. So, uh, so thank you, John, and welcome. Again, please put any questions in the Q&A panel, and I will get out of the way and turn it over to the two of you. And welcome to all of you. I just noticed someone from Australia and my friends in Australia. Thank you for tuning in. I have no idea what time it is there, but God bless you for being here. <laughs> yes, uh, thank Rachel, you. Rachel and I thank worked you. on a PowerPoint presentation for this, um, <laughs> and we're going to go to that and, and, and just charge on through to be efficient with our time. Uh, but of course, there will be question and answer at the end. So by all means, um, please you'll be ask able questions. To ask questions along the way. Oh, hi, Spencer. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here with us on the 5th. We're so thankful for your time. Absolutely. All right. Um, it just takes just one moment to get you into the right place. There we are. So uh, conversational solfege uh, is, uh, you know, we, if you are into our methodology, we have a book one and a book two, and the recorder book covers the entire scope of the two books. Uh, ideally, uh, I, I usually think of book one and two as a curriculum for elementary school. That's a reasonable amount for an elementary school. And the recorder book was written to complement uh, level one and level two with recorder activities and recorder understandings along the way. I don't think uh, uh, it would be a, a, you could certainly do a recorder unit uh, for a year or half a year and use this book but it was more intended to be integrated throughout conversational selfish, just as you might go to uh, ORF instruments uh, throughout the elementary years. And uh, now we're gonna do this with ORF instruments. And now we're in next year, we're gonna do this with ORF instruments. We're thinking of the same thing with the recorder that it would be used throughout the elementary years as a, uh, an instrumental extension of what they're learning in conversational selfish. Um, what's really unique about this book, as opposed to other books for a recorder, is that we're going to teach children to play by ear. Uh, I'm not sure there's even another method that does that. The whole idea of conversational sofa is just that it is a conversational approach, which means that we should be able to understand music by the sound of music and apply it to an instrument. So what's unique to this is the students are going to be uh, guided through how to learn to play by ear. And then they are gonna be introduced to the notation and they will also learn to play by notation. But um, it'll be a twofold process. Uh, we'll explain it as we go along. Another thing that's unique to it is that uh, 
the, the literature of American folk songs is very balanced in two, four, and six, eight. And we don't see that balance in too many other methodologies. Um, our, our, if you studied poetry in high school, you know that the primary meter of, a, of poetry in English language is iambic pentameter, and that's six, eight. Uh, so it's, it would be unfortunate for us not to understand 6-8 along with 2-4. And we've made 6-8 easy. We've made 6-8 as easy as 2-4. And that way students can experience both meters and especially 6-8 meter, which is so indicative to the English language culture. Uh, one of the things that we've done that is another unique, wonderful feature is because we're gonna teach you to play by ear, it requires that there is an awful lot of opportunities for you to use your ears. And in order to do that, we set up online um, 200 tracks. So that there are 200 tracks that are available to you uh, when you purchase or when you decide to go with this recorder approach uh, where the students can either use them in, you can use them in the classroom with their students. They're all streamable or you can choose to give them as homework assignments. The students can do them at home. Um, the tracks, depending on <laughs> which, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, format you're using, Google or Firefox or uh, Safari, on Google, they're actually downloadable. So you can go and push a button and you will find here in the three dots, uh, download this track. So the 200 tracks can be used uh, in your classroom as downloadable tracks as well. What's what the advantage of that is, is that the students can be guided through the, the how to play by ear. And that's the tricky part that uh, other teachers are, have, don't have much uh, access to or, or may wonder how to teach their students by uh, ear. And here we have the 200 tracks to guide you. They're coded. So you would see a code by each of the 200 tracks. And that would be, um, Track number one, unit one, step two, patterns 1A. So once you get into the code, you will see quickly how they align with the 12 steps of conversational solfege, which we'll be going into just briefly for a little while. But the main Thank issue you. is, go ahead. Really Rachel. quick, all of the tracks in the book, you, you'll know which track to use. If you look in the book, There's it'll say track one, track two, track 134. So you'll be able to find them quickly as well. Right. Uh, and you'll be given when, when uh, in the books, you're given a website that you can find this very picture you're looking at right now, where you can uh, play any of the tracks. We'll be playing several of them in this little presentation in the coming minutes. So you'll get a sense of how these tracks work. But in addition to the book, know that there are 200 tracks online so the students can learn to play by ear. Uh, one of the main processes that we use in this book is a three-step process that whatever we're studying, uh, rhythm or melody, uh, uh, tone sets, uh, we have a three-step process where the students either sing or speak uh, the solfege or rhythm syllables first, and then they sing or speak the solfege syllables while fingering on their instrument. So you'll see students playing uh, or, or, or fingering while they're, they're singing, they're moving their fingers on the recorder and singing solfege at the same time. That would be step number two. And then the third step is now that you've done that, we, you know how to finger and you have the solfege in your mind, then go ahead and play with the intent of the quote at the bottom of the page that this will allow students to express music through instruments rather than using muse instruments to hear notation. Traditionally, most students get instrument notation lessons, but they're not really getting music lessons. Music is an aural art and music should be understand by the ear, understood by the ear. But unfortunately, teachers put a book of notation in front of children and say, well, that says G and this is how you finger G. But the students don't know what it should sound like until after they blow into the instrument. What our approach does is it has the students sing or speak first what they're looking at so that we know that they understand the notation and the sound that the notation uh, implies and then practice the fingering while they're singing. So when they do play, they already have an expectation of what the music should sound like that will allow them then to express the music through the instrument rather than use the instrument to hear the notation. 
John, Adobe. I'm going to jump in real quick. Yeah. Um, just to clarify, because you mentioned seeing they can speak and sing what they see. The majority of this process is all oral. The students aren't going to see notation for a, a while. They're going to have songs or work with patterns that they've already been hearing so that you've got three layers of scaffolding so that by the time they play it, it's going to be, you know, we always hate, oh, they're going to squeak. They're going to, they're going to do this. It's going to be a more musical sound than what you might be used to. Um, I know that for years in the classroom where I was practicing this, that whole scaffold of sing or speak, speak and finger or sing and finger and now play really set even the student who might have the least dexterity up for success. Right. It's sort of like if I, if I gave you a sheet of Russian and I asked you to type it on a Russian typewriter, you certainly could type it on a Russian typewriter, but you would have no idea what you were typing. And oftentimes music is taught that way. Here's the notation and here's how to finger the notation, but you really don't know what it's gonna sound like until after you, bl you blow on the recorder. We would like the students to know what it should sound like before they blow on the recorder. So they're gonna already know what it sounds like because they're musically literate. They, 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 they speak this language. And then when they blow on the recorder, they have an expectation. The intonation will be better. The rhythm accuracy will be better. They know when they're making mistakes or not making mistakes because they are hearing it before they're playing it. It's based on the 12 steps of conversational solfege. And those that are using conversational solfege uh, will recognize that the second box, uh, the four steps are all about playing by ear or singing by ear, or uh, paying attention to the sound of music, yay Rogers and Hammerstein, the sound of music. And after they've gone through these first five steps, then we say, and by the way, this is what it looks like. And you know, you can think about it, that's very much the way we learn language. Children, before they come to a kindergarten or first grade, know thousands of words by ear, and their brain is organized to understand language by ear. And then one day they come to school and they say, oh, by the way, there's a way you can see language. It's called the alphabet. And then we start to read and write it. But the brain is organized for language by ear first for several years. And then we layer the sight on it. And that's what we've done in the recorder. We've decided to help them understand how to play recorder by ear first. And after they can play something, we say, oh, by the way, there's a way you can see this. It's called notation. And then in the third box here, reading, we run them through, and here is the way you can see what it is you've been playing. Step seven especially is playing things or seeing things you already know how to play. And then step eight is a follow-up for that, where we ask them, now that you know how to see what you already can play, let's see if you can play something from notation that you've never played before. And so that's how the, the reading unfolds. But there's this wonderful process of playing by ear prior to that, which is unique to this approach. Also included in this book are several things. Rachel was very much involved in making sure that these things were included in the book. So Rachel, I'll turn this over to you. All right, thank you, John. Uh, there's a lot of additions that I thought would benefit um, the teacher uh, who chooses to use this in their in their classroom. Uh, one thing that I did uh, in my years of experience in the classroom was, and which led me to why am I teaching recorder this way when I'm using conversational in my classroom, what would happen if I put the two together? And so I started going through the conversational solfege purple book levels one and two through the techniques and kind of adjusting those techniques when I was teaching the recorder. You know, what would colored hoops look like with recorder? Uh, what would Canon look like with recorder? And so at the beginning of the teacher's manual in the recorder book, there is a list of techniques for each step, except for the writing. We're not including writing um, in the conversational recorder book that you can bring in to use with the recorder. And these aren't the only techniques you can use. You absolutely can create your own techniques, but these are just um, a handful of techniques to assist you uh, when you're um, teaching students recorder. Uh, to help this wonderful little uh, graphic was created um, by a GIA artist. And uh, this little technique is throughout 
the teacher manual, which will uh, provide suggested te techniques. So when you see that uh, graphic, you'll you can say, oh, at step two, try this technique, or at step eight, the author authors have found that this technique is beneficial. Um, also included in um, for all of the songs in the book are baseline melodies, um, and we encourage that before the students. Uh, do the baseline melodies. If, if you know if they know the song, if they don't know the song, let them try to figure out the baseline melody first. It's something that we do with conversational solfege, but they are written there. But we encourage that you sing them, um, or and then after they've been sung, to apply it on the xylophone. So with any instrument, we encourage that you sing before you play, because if you can sing it, you absolutely can play it, and that's the benefit of. Um, having a conversational recorder approach to the instrument um, or any instrument. If you're using songs that they know or they have these pitches in their heads, these rhythms internalized, when they do practice at home, they know if they've made a mistake. They know if something doesn't come out right. Um, and then they can work to match what they're playing to what they're what they're thinking musically. There's also sample lesson plans. There's five sample lesson plans in the back of the book, the teacher's manual, so that you might see how recorder can be incorporated into your classroom. In the years that I taught in Virginia, I taught uh, recorder third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and then into sixth grade at the schools that I taught at that had sixth grade. And it was something that was just great because you could just build and scaffold upon. And it wasn't, I didn't spend entire 30 or 45 minutes on recorder. Sometimes recorder was 20 minutes. Sometimes recorder was five minutes. Sometimes recorder was the whole lesson depending on what activity the students were engaged in. Um, the fingering charts are also uh, a, a little different than what you may have seen. Typically, uh, we see the recorder and we see the left hand on the right side of our body and the left hand at the left side of the body. And I just noticed that in the teaching, in my teaching, that confused some students. So I would often flip uh, the recorder charts and, and create my own. So if you notice, uh, these recorders are upside down so that when the student is looking at the fingering chart, they're looking at the recorder from their perspective. Um, and I, I just often noticed that when the students were, were uh, singing and fingering, they would look down at their fingers. And I thought, well, if they had a, recording, a recorder fingering chart that showed that to them, that might be more helpful. And you'll also notice that we have little hands at the side uh, that label left hand and, and right hand. And there's one for each unit. Of the of the tonal of the tonal units, there is one uh, for in the back of the book. If you wish to, you know, create a, a larger uh, size, and then lastly, uh, for many many years, well, every year that I've taught in the public schools, um, I've worked with students with disabilities, and I just want to make a quick caveat that when I say disability, it's because disability is a social construct. I'm not saying that the student is disabled. So, for instance, my son Ben, he has autism. Coolest kid I know. When he's in his house, he's just Ben, uh, but when he leaves and goes into school or other social spaces, those spaces can disable him um, if those individuals do not know how to respond or work with him. So I have a strong passion for uh, students with disabilities. It's my research focus. Um, it was part of my dissertation work. And so in the back of the recorder book, there are suggestions on how to help students who have different uh, impairments, whether they have visual impairments, hearing impairments, uh, if, they're, if they have uh, physical impairments. Um, I've taught students that have uh, digit differences or limb differences and have been very successful on the recorder. Um, so if that is something that you've been going, I, I have these students and I want them to play recorder and I want them to be a part of this class and not played on a xylophone or, or sing, then there are suggestions for how to work uh, with these amazing students in your classroom, as well as suggestions of assistive devices that can also uh, be recorded to sound like a recorder if they don't have the dexterity, perhaps they're playing with their feet or their elbow or their chin, which I have had students do in the past. So these are some extras that are included in the teacher's manual for you. Thank you, Rachel, that's fantastic. I think these were such wonderful ideas to include with the recorder book. Um, and you were the person to do it because you know more about this than anybody I know. 
Uh, now, the, the units themselves, um, the first three units, they, as I said, it follows the Conversational Solfege books. And if anyone watching is familiar with those books, they know that the first three units are rhythm units where students are learning rhythmic patterns. And we use that in the recorder book as an opportunity to teach them fingering. So while they'll be studying uh, two eighth notes and a quarter note, they are given the option of uh, four different notes that they can play rhythm patterns on. Um, uh, as we go through uh, some teachers, another unique feature of this book, which Rachel will be speaking about briefly in a moment, is that <laughs> once we start uh, playing on the recorder, uh, actual melodies, uh, some teachers uh, prefer to have their students play in the key of G, and some teachers prefer to have their students play in the key of F. And we give teachers both options. So in the first few units, uh, things are presented in both keys. But in the first three units, we, we set them up for the fingering so that they could play in F, FGA for Do, Re, Mi, or GAB for Do, Re, Mi. Um, so um, this is unit one. The first thing we teach are two eighth notes and a quarter note. And we guide them through playing by ear. And to do that, we have in the book a list of tracks. If you are a teacher and you want to introduce your students to the notes they need to play in G, so they'll be playing G, A, and B. Here are the tracks that you will use for these four steps of uh, aural awareness and playing the recorder. If you want to teach your students starting in the key of F, which would align with the conversational solfege books, so they would learn to play F, G and A, then these are the tracks that you can use to develop that as well. Uh, again, we are following the process of conversational solfege. So first the students are told what the patterns are. Then we ask the students to tell us what the patterns are. And then we give them something they've never heard before at step four. And we say, well, now that you can figure out things you know, can you figure out something you've never heard before? And another wonderful thing about the book, always step five asks the students to improvise. So as we cycle through each of these units, each new rhythm and each new tonal pattern that they learn, when they get to step five, we're gonna ask them to improvise. So improvisation is a, a, a step along the way in the journey of learning how to play the recorder. Um, John, can I add something at the yes. create phase? So you might be thinking, so they're only going to play one rhythm on a single note and they, they will throughout a lot of this, but the wonderful part about the create phase is this is where a lot of differentiated, well, it's differentiated throughout in my opinion, but you might have that student who's like, oh, well, I can play G, A, N, B or F, G, N, A on th this, these rhythms, or you might have the student who only feels comfortable playing this rhythm pattern on G or their created rhythm pattern on A. So there is flexibility at the create stage with the recording where uh, the, the gentleman and I who recorded uh, the tracks uh, will say any pitches ready play. So it really adds to this beginning uh, improvisation uh, for students as they go through the process. Thanks for letting me interrupt. No, not only are they going to be improvising rhythmically in unit one, two, and three, but we uh, guide them through improvise, ready, play G, ready, play A, ready, play B, and then we say any pitches, ready, play. So they're allowed to also improvise on which tones they wish to play the rhythm patterns on. Um, let me go on. Uh, 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 these are tracks uh, uh, that are online. Uh, for example, um, let's do track eight. So suppose you're introducing uh, the recorder and you choose to use F for Do. Um, you would use, as it says here, track eight. And each one of these tracks have that three-step process I mentioned earlier. First, you'll be asked just to sing improvisations. Then you'll be asked to sing and finger on the recorder the same improvisations. And finally, we'll be asked to play your improvisation on the recorder. So every single track of the 200 tracks asks children to do all three of those things. First, they'll ask them to sing, then sing and finger, and then play. Let's hear a little bit of track eight, where students are being asked to improvise in the key of F 
on the rhythm of quarter note and two eighth notes. Oh, come back, come back. Step five, conversational create. Listen to this rhythm pattern and create a different pattern using rhythm syllables. Do, do, de, do, do. And here you would create a pattern. Finger F, ready, play. Listen to this rhythm pattern and create a different pattern using rhythm syllables. Do, de, do, do, de, do. And John, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock here with it being 825. We want to make sure we have 15 minutes for questions. Do we want yes. to not spend too much time on this? So uh, what you heard is we asked you to do it by voice. You know, even if you were not teaching recorder, these tracks ask you to do the voice part first, and that could be any general music class. And when we ask you to finger a certain note in these first rhythm units, it's just to help you uh, the students, it helped to help the students learn what is the fingering for F, G, A, and B. Uh, then, after they've done the tracks online, you see the stop sign at the bottom. It says, don't continue until you've worked on their ears. So we ask the students to learn to play by ear first. And then we say, oh, and by the way, there's a way you can see what you've done. And that's where you pull out the student books. And in the student book, they will now see the pattern. Um, you can use the tracks again. Uh, you, there are, uh, there's uh, information in the book that says, repeat each pattern after the teacher reads it aloud. So the teacher could read, do, do, day, do, do, and the students would then repeat it or end or play it on a particular note. But you also could use the tracks where the students are hearing on the track, listen to this pattern while you're looking at it and repeat it afterwards. So it's step six where we make the connection for it. And by the way, this is what it looks like. But they've already had five steps of playing by ear before we get to the point of we say, and now let's see what that looks like. So here we are showing patterns that are familiar to them that they've already played by ear. And then we give them some to sight read. They've never seen these patterns and they've never heard these patterns. And we wanna see if they've made the connection. Have you made the visual sound connection? Can we show you something that you've never seen for the first time? And the instructions in the book say, think and then speak each pattern using rhythm syllables, and then think and then play each pattern on any pitch. So the students again can choose which pitch they'd like to play the patterns. But we, we culminate each unit with this step six sight reading, which we hope we've led up uh, to enough support uh, abilities that when they get to step eight, it's not a scary thing. It should be effortless. The idea of sight reading should be effortless. And we've provided enough ear preparations and eye preparations. So by the time they get to the step in each unit and we show them something to sight read, it's effortless. They have no problem. You John, see this. Do you yes. want me to explain why F now or when we get um, to unit four? Let's wait till four. Okay. To we're gonna to talk to you about why some people choose to start in the key of G and some people start, start in the key of F. In fact, in about one minute, we're gonna do that. Um, so the first unit is a, a beat and a beat can have two parts. The next unit is how to read rhythms where it's in six, eight. This was very important to me because so much of our culture, uh, especially in English speaking culture, uh, the natural rhythm of our language is iambic pentameter, which is six, eight. So it was important for me to be sure that students understood how to play by ear and by sight equally in two, four and six, eight. So after unit one, where we learn how to read and hear music that has a beat in two parts, then in unit two, we learn how to hear and read music that has a beat and three parts. And again, they're guided through the tracks uh, for the ear playing by ear. So all this is online. In your classroom, you can simply click one of the tracks and let the lead, track lead the class. Or you can give it as homework assignment and say, here's the link. Uh, it's on the school webpage. Go home and listen to track nine or listen to track nine and 10. And when you come back to school tomorrow, we'll review that. It could very well be the upside down model where you uh, have reverse teaching in the classroom. 
And then the third, so here's the second unit. They uh, are, are finally, after doing the ear work, we say, and by the way, this is what it looks like. And here is some sight reading examples that you can try to see if you can read this rhythm. And then and the let third me dive unit, in real quick about the ahead, yes. about the devices. If not all students may have devices at home to download the tracks or listen to. So something that I did in my own classroom, even though I didn't have the tracks, is I would provide uh, part uh, space in the classroom for them to partner or work in groups to practice during the class, especially when I worked at schools where bringing the recorder home may not have worked or they didn't have access to videos that I made. So I tried to make that accessible because we all know that not all students have access to our smartphones or computers or things. So there are ways that you know you can use these tracks if they aren't able to be used at home. Thank you, John. No, perfect. Uh, so this was the second unit in the recorder book. And then the third unit is the most common six eight pattern, this quarter followed by the eighth note. This is Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Jack and Joe went up the hill. Oats, fees, beans, and barley grow. Ring around the rosy. This is the most common pattern in English language poetry and folk song. So it was important for us to get to this pattern early. Um, so the students are going to explore this the same way, first by ear. There are tracks online where you can explore the notes that you'll need to play Do, Re, Mi in the key of G or Do, Re, Mi in the key of F. Rachel's going to explain all that in just a minute. And uh, after they've done their ear, you see at the bottom of the page, stop. Don't go on until they've done their ear work because we want the students to be able to play by ear first. And then we say, by the way, there's a way you can see what you're doing and it looks like this. So in the book, the student books that they would have, uh, they finally will see the rhythm patterns and they will play these just like before. Uh, we will guide them through uh, using the different fingerings for the key of F and the key of G to play these patterns. And sight read, there's a group that are, they will have never seen before and can you actually read the notation now and sight read patterns that are, are new and fresh. When we finally get to melody in step four or unit four, we, we allow the teachers to make a choice. If the teachers would like to teach recorder in the key of G, they can focus on that first. And Rachel's gonna talk about some teachers prefer to teach starting in the key of F. Either way, both versions are given in the book. And whichever one you start with is up to you. And then you should go do the other one after that. So if you prefer to do the key of G, great. And then go back and do it again teaching the students that they also can play in another location, the key of F. But many teachers prefer to start in the key of F. And after they've done the, this unit in the key of F, we go back and say, well, you can also do this in the key of G and this is how that works. In this unit, uh, if you're doing the key of F, uh, we have all this ear work. Now we don't expect teachers to do every single track. Uh, in conversational solfege, you would be doing all this with your voice. We do expect students to go through all the tracks with their voice. And all of those are recorded. So you can have the students do all of the ear training for playing by ear. Uh, you could do all the tracks by voice. Then you would select which tracks. Here I have selected track 25, 27, 28, 32, 36, and 38. And those are the ones where I'm gonna have the students bring out their recorder. So you can see over here what those are. 25 is they're gonna learn a song, closet key. 27, they're gonna practice some patterns that have no rhythms. 28, they're gonna practice patterns in two, four. Practice three, four, or practice 32, they're gonna listen and hear a song that's in two, four. Pra 36, they're gonna hear an unfamiliar song in two, four, and see if they could learn to hear it and play it on the recorder. And finally, track 38, they're gonna improvise in two four, but if they are uh, interested, uh, these were all uh, the key of G tracks. And if we wanted to play in the key of F, I selected which tracks over here I would use. This is just my choice of which tracks. Teachers can choose which tracks they wish to use the recorder with. And here I've chosen, even though I will sing all of the tracks and, and the online tracks give you everything sung first, and then it gives you, after you sing it, how to do it with an instrument. And I, w these are the tracks I chose that I would also include the recorder with. So we would sing them first and then play. Why don't we do one of these? Um, let's suppose 
we're at uh, track, mm, I don't know, uh, 44. Track 44 is hearing do, re, mi patterns in six, eight. Uh, so as I've said, the method is sing, sing and finger, and then play. So you'll hear all three of those steps on track 44. Sing after Listen each pattern. Listen to each tonal pattern and repeat each pattern using solfege syllables. Do, 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 re. And the student would sing that. One more. Do, do, re, mi, mi, re. And then after a while, they're asked, can you do that and also finger on your recorder? What Pattern using solfege syllables while fingering. F is do. Do, 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 re. Here, the student would sing back with syllables and finger on the recorder at the same time. Do, do, re, mi, mi, re. And then after that, we asked them to actually play the recorder. Do, do. Let's see if I can find it. Mi, 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 re. I'm not finding the right spot. Sorry about that. That's okay. I I think they they, they can hear it on the recording. Do, and, the, do, re, mi, mi, and here the student would play back the pattern on the recorder. So the process again is the students sing the pattern, then they're invited again to sing and play the pattern or sing and finger the pattern. And finally, they hear the pattern sung and they play it. They're playing by ear. This is the way we guide them to learn how to play by ear. Uh, through all this, the ear aural steps of uh, patterns and then even improvisation down here, track 54, they're asked to make up patterns and improvise. Listen to each tonal pattern and create a different pattern using solfege syllables. Do, 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 re. And the student might sing me, 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 re, 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 do, 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 do. And then each track has them doing it by just singing. And then it's repeated with sing and finger while you're making up a pattern. And finally, can you play your response, your improvised pattern? So sing, sing and finger, play. So why do we start on F? Uh, and why do we have F? Why do we have G? The reason is uh, when I was teaching in the classroom, I first started with VAG and I used a variety of other methods. And it was when you see this note, press this, when you see this note, press this. And I've always loved recorder. It was, you know, something I've played since elementary school. But when I started using conversational solfege in my classroom, the students could do some really wonderful things with their voices, but it wasn't transferring to the instrument. And I thought, well, why am I still teaching the recorder and B, A, and G when so many of the songs that they're singing in conversational solfege is an F? And in a lot of the songs in conversational solfege, I've used in kindergarten and first grade and second grade with first steps in music. And it doesn't mean that, you know, they're only hearing F and G. They're hearing a variety of, of tonalities and experiencing a variety of meters. You know, Phyllis Weichart's rhythmically moving and you're doing those movement activities. But because I was building their ear up in certain familiar songs from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, when I finally put the recorder in their hand and I said, okay, let's just try this year in F, let's just see what happens. They don't know that fork to F is hard, only if I tell them. And I said, you know what? This is, you know, this is F. I'm trying to be your mirror. This is left hand, right hand. This is F. Uh, this is Do, this is G, this is Ray, this is A, this is me. And I pulled out those familiar rhythms from units one, two, and three and would say, okay, decode this rhythm, finger F, say it again, now play. And it was, it was wonderful. And um, I do, uh, Christina, I do teach it in the mirror because that extra visual is an anchor for them. 
Uh, and often I'll teach on a tenor recorder too, because it's a large example that students can see and they can see the spacing between the fingers. Um, and so I found that the students, I, I could play more songs more quickly because instead of asking them to, as John said, type fingers on, you know, do the Russian typewriter and, or they see this note and push their finger here, they were recalling all of the songs that they had learned from kindergarten, first grade, second, and then the songs in conversational solfege that used do, re, mi, that I would, I could say, okay, go home and figure out all the songs that you know. And students were coming back, oh, I figured out this one, and oh, I figured out this one, and oh, I, 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 found, I found out this other song is do, re, mi, and I learned how to play it. And instead of this fighting to like practice the recorder, I found that students had more joy in playing the recorder and students were more artful in their playing. We all have heard that, you know, bah, 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 <laughs> bah, bah, and you're like, oh my gosh, how many times do I have to hear it? Whereas, you know, students would, would do Sailor Sailor, which is in 6-8 and it was, ya da 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 ya da 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 and we have a video of uh, uh, my former fourth grade, the former fourth grade students that I taught uh, playing in G uh, and then transposing to F uh, because why not, right? They can do it. If they can do it in one key, they can do it in another key. And so I know F sounds scary. You're like, oh my gosh, why would you teach F? Because their ear is set to F for so many songs that when they put that instrument in their hand, it's just an extension of what they already know. And so they have immediate success, which is a huge motivator. You know, sometimes you're like, why aren't you practicing? Are you practicing? Take the home. I stopped using recorder homework slips years ago because they were motivated to play because they could already hear a load of songs. And then I would just scaffold, you know, an, you know adding on as we go through the units. Also, it engages their, their right hand immediately. I don't have to worry about their right hand hanging out on their lap or their right hand picking their nose or their right hand bothering their neighbor beside them, right? Like their bottom hand is already in. And also for fork deaf, you might be going, Grimsby, you're crazy. Some of the undergraduates call me Grimsby. You're crazy. They're pink. It's okay if their pinkies don't touch. Yes, they're fork. The pinkies should be down for forked F. But I had to reteach recorder in third grade. That was by my counties that I taught in. Third grade is when we started recorder. I wanted it to be an extension of their musical knowledge. And so fork deaf it was. And I told them, you know, eventually your pinky is going to need to go down, but you can't do that yet. That doesn't mean you can't play the recorder. So as soon as your pinky can go down, put it down. And it was really not a thing, you know, it. It sounds weird, it sounds different, it sounds unnatural to start playing recorder in F, but it truly revolutionized and made my recorder teaching more joyful and a lot more easier for the students. Yeah. And that's why there's F and G. That doesn't mean you have to start in F. That's why we did the book in F and G, because more people are, you know, there are people who are more comfortable with G. And hey, that's great because that's you. And that's wonderful. And if you start in G, you still need to teach the students how to play in F. So it's just a choice of which one you choose to start with first. If you start with F, then you teach G, or if you start with G and then you teach F. And you also see this icon Re Rachel was talking about. And on the bottom of each page, we say, well, whatever step you're at, by the way, in this book, we've given the teacher games that they can play at that step. So you can do online what that step is, but here's a game to further reinforce the same step, the same concept. Um, so there are fun games to do along the way. Uh, after you've played by ear, stop, don't go further until your ear has been developed. And then by the way, this is what it looks like. And first we just show them tones so they're not uh, distracted by the rhythms. And then we show them, and here's how to add the rhythms you've learned in units one, two, and three to do, re, mi and the songs that they have heard already. So we always begin with songs they know, and we say, and this is what it looks like. And here you see the bass line as well. So you can teach the do, 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 so, do by voice. They could sing as a second part, or it could be played on a bass xylophone. This, in this unit, we put, present everything in both keys so teachers can choose. 
Do I want to show my students this in the key of F, G, or do I want to show it in the key of F? So you can see in the book, we have both of them in the key of G and both of them in the key of F. And then we re rehearse uh, Do, Re, Mi in 6, 8. So we have patterns for them to warm up. Teachers can choose which one to do first, but then they should do the second one also. And the same thing, here are songs they know in the key of G and in the key of F. And after they do that, they're ready to sight read. But you see, our approach to notation is we go for ear first, show them and what you're playing already, this is what it looks like. And then we say, now I wonder if you could figure out by yourself how to play these patterns. So we have patterns and songs that they have never seen before. And we ask them, can you sight read these songs? We like them to do it with their voice first because then they are expressing the music through the instrument and not using the instrument to hear the notation. So we ask them to sing the, pat the songs first. And again, we present all these songs in both keys in the key of G and the key of F, the same songs. To show you what's in the rest of the book quickly, because we're running out of time fast, after we teach Do, Re, Mi, we add So to the, the, the mix. And again, where everything is presented in both keys. But this is the last unit we present everything in both keys, because we're hoping that the teachers by now will have taught the students the other key and the other fingering. By now, you should have covered both of them. Whatever your choice was for the first one, now we hope you've also gone and done the second one so that we can go on. Uh, here's Rachel's class. Rachel, do you want to say anything before I play about your students transposing? They're looking at something in F, and Rachel's going to ask them to transpose it and play it in G. And because they know solfege, solfege syllables allow them to transpose effortlessly. So this song, anything? yes, thank you. Uh, they uh, sang it first. Uh, this was our unfamiliar uh, song and they sing it in G. And so I like to connect to what students know. So in Virginia, there's a Fredericksburg and there's a Gainesville. So you might hear me say, all right, now try this in Fredericksburg. Well, Fredericksburg is south of Gainesville. So they know that F is lower than G. It just, <laughs> you know, little, little tricks to kind of help uh, anchors for, for students who might, you know, transcribe, uh, not transcribing, but transposing can be can be difficult, especially if you're a brass player. So, you know, you know that beginning of those of you who are brass players for years. So you're going to see them play it first in G, and then you're going to see that they have space to think it, and then they're going to play it. So when you ask them to play in F, you're saying, now let's play it in Fredericksburg, because that's the euphemism for the key of F. Yes. <laughs> okay. One, two, song. Stop. Take 30 seconds to go through it in Fredericksburg. Which note is Do? Everyone? Thanks. Sir? I forgot what was in Show me and take off your pointer and there's soul. So it's just your second and thumb hole, those two. 15 more seconds, yes sir? Will we get a paper version of this? Uh, yes, you will get the notation. Um, I don't know if I have it copied already. All right, sitting tall. Blowing softly. Eric, honey, what note do we start on? Yes, in Fredericksburg. One, two, softly. <gasps> Play it again, fix that mistake. <gasps> Beautiful. And they were looking at it in G, but playing it in F. Is that right? Yep. 
Yeah, so they were transposing. That's amazing, amazing. All right, um, the rest of the book, we'll, we have to save some time. We're already a little over. We need some questions and answers, but hit yep. the rest of the book. Next, we teach a rest in two, four and the two beat note in two, four. Then we teach the rest in six, eight and the two beat note in six, eight. We add, you just heard them playing in do, re, mi, so, and then we add la. So they're playing pentatonic songs, do, re, mi, so, la. And then they play pentachordal songs, five notes with no gap, do, re, mi, fa, so songs. And we bring the la back for six note songs or hexachordal songs and introduce two new locations. So they've played in F and G, and now they're gonna be playing in the key of D and C, which completes all the notes they need to know how to play on the recorder. The very last thing is just this interesting fun rhythm for them to play. Um, so it is uh, the final thing that's in the book. All right, I'm gonna stop Ooh, share. What a cool activity with that one is uh, Ferro, Caril, 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 Lima, uh, Callao, Callao, and the first steps in global music has that rhythm. It would be really cool if they improvised with, sorry. Uh, my teacher brain doesn't shut off, friends. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, we've saved a little bit of time for questions and answers. Hi, Alec. Hello, everyone. Okay. Let's go ahead and go through these as quickly as we can. Rachel. What grade level do you generally be generally generally begin recorder? And do you have students who've already gone through a part of conversational solfege before you start them on the recorder? Yes. So for me, we were asked to start in third grade. However, I would wait until the students were at unit four. Um, around step six before I handed them their recorder because I really wanted them to have their ear in place before the instrument is in hand. And, and that's something that Jeff Rohn, I learned from him in my research classes. You know, he would always say, have the instrument, have the ear in place before the instrument in hand. And so um, it really depends. It's one of the things that I fell in love with about the conversational soulfish and first steps curriculum is that it's developmental and not chronological. And so I could have third graders coming in and we'd start recorder in October and I'd have third graders where we might learn F, G, and A and work on some rhythms, but we really didn't start until fourth grade because they weren't at unit four yet. I will say, be patient with them and let the child tell you what their pace is. And if you wait until they're ready, they'll catch up. Like the growth rate is, is, is just amazing. So don't think you have to push through um, uh, conversational solfege to get to recorder let them show you where they're ready and then bring it in. So I always waited until unit four. Mm -hmm. um, I know some districts might be a little more strict and you need to start at unit one, then you can spend a lot of time working on technique, fingering position, breathing, tonguing, um, on the improvisation. How many songs can you create with these three notes, right? You know, there's, there's I always waited to start. And so I will say, even though I might have waited until you know fourth grade, by the time they left me in fifth or sixth grade, they were they were going through so many units because that foundation was built. Great. We had a couple questions about do you uh, do the fingering charts in German or Baroque fingerings? Baroque. I love the forked F. I love 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 the forked F. And it's you might think they're going to struggle with it in like they're going to struggle with the recorder at the beginning anyways, because it's something new to them. So let them figure it out. Kids can do good, awesome things. Great. I think you did say this before, but just what is the total range of notes covered on the recorder by the end of the method? Well, from low C, the, we go all the way down to C and then all the way up to La in G. So what is that? A, G, 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 B, D, E, E. e. Yeah, so high E. So we go all the way from low C up to high E. Someone wanted to know about whether you can download the audio files. Uh, currently, they're stream only, but I think if we do get requests, we will certainly make them available for download. Well, I have to tell you, Alec, on Google, they're downloadable. Do I downloaded okay. all those today on Google. <laughs> so I do, do it track by track, but we'll do the whole thing. Well, and uh, someone also help. asked, sorry. That just might help those students who maybe they have a CD player and not a device. Maybe they go home with a CD. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And uh, someone also asked about, will we be making this available as an ebook? And yes, we are planning to make this available as an ebook early this fall. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, so 
Uh, so someone noticed, are the rhythm patterns the same as set forth in the rhythm books from conversational solfege? They are. We've, we copied them identically, so there would be that alignment between what they're learning in the general music class and the application to the instrument. Great. Uh, so Tom, so maybe you can talk a little bit about what is in the teacher's manual that's not in the student book and vice versa, and can you use one? Do you need to have both? Yeah. Rachel, you have, mostly it's your stuff. Well, so there's a lot that's in the teacher's manual that's not in the student manual. And the thing that I like about the student manual is I don't believe the baselines are included in. They are. They are included in the student manual. They are. Okay. Um, so really, it's just the songs. It's the literature. And the literature has, I mean, that's one of the reasons um, that the book is took a few years is, you know, we went through each song. Um, and it, it, each song should uh, have like where it's from. And, you know, we tried to, to offer that uh, there, uh, which is why you'll see there, there are some differences. Um, but well, the I mean, teacher's manual has, has the everything. lesson plans, yeah. the, the, the special needs information, the uh, uh, techniques for breathing and fingering and embouchure. Um, yep. this, this, the fingering charts that you can duplicate for the classroom. There's a whole chapter on the embouchure. I forgot about that on like embouchure and breathing techniques. Whoops. <laughs> but I mean, the student books I like because not everyone can see a projected screen, especially if you have a narrow classroom or not a large classroom. And those, you know, I, you can laminate. And, and if, we're, if we're getting them ready for going on to band and orchestra, then they are they are going to have printed notation that they're going to be playing from. And this prepares them. If they have a student book and they're looking at printed notation, they're not going to be looking at a screen in band and orchestra. So we're, we're preparing them for the process that they may be going into. Someone said, some of us were not quite where we'd like to be after COVID as far as tuneful, beautiful, and artful are concerned. <laughs> Do you still recommend waiting or is there a benefit to using recorder early as a mo as a motivator for your kids? Please let them be tuneful, beatful, and artful. I know, I know COVID, we're like, oh, they're behind. They're right where they need to be. I, 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 you know, I look at my son and I look at my daughter. My daughter's a 16 year old. She's going to be a junior and the amount of pressure she feels for, oh my gosh, we didn't get this and we didn't get this and da, da, da. And I don't want the, I don't want any kid to feel that way. Like maybe it was nice that we kind of chilled and, you know, they, just because we didn't, weren't able to sing in person doesn't mean that they weren't singing at home, the songs you taught them before. So please, please just let them let them be tuneful, beatful, and artful. And if they don't get through all of the recorder curriculum, it, it's it's not, not a bad thing because you allowed them to music in a space where they could be successful and build community rather and, than feeling pressure. And you know, I've spoken for years about the 30 year plan. And I always think of these children 30 years from now and what's important for them 30 years from now, what's important for them is tuneful people and artful that they can sing to their children and be, feel comfortable and dancing and, and be moved by beautiful music. And if they can't play recorder when they're 30 years old, who cares? So I, I don't think recorder is, is the more important thing. I think it is a lovely extension of yeah. their tuneful people, artful behaviors. And it should be added as an extension, not in place of. Do you have trouble with students forgetting their instruments at home? And how often do you see your students? So, oh, how often? Well, it depends on the schools that I taught in. So in one school, I saw the students uh, once a week for 45 minutes. And another school that I taught in, I saw the students once a week, uh, once every six days, excuse me. And on one of those days, I was teaching reading and science and math. Go figure. Um, and I'm sure some of you out there can relate. Uh, and then in the last, and then another school that I taught at, I, um, I my goal was to be, become a professor of music education. I wanted a variety of, of experiences to take in the classroom. If you're wondering why, gosh, she taught at a lot of schools. Um, and then I've had one, twice a week for 30 minutes. And then the last school I taught at was like the most amazing schedule I ever had in my life. I saw the students kindergarten through third grade three times a week for 30 minutes fourth, fifth, and sixth grade had an hour of music, which was, was just a gift. So I don't, and what no, was and the I've next heard, question? 
Well, it had to do with the recorders and bringing the recorders back. Oh, yes. Home. Okay. So I had a bucket of recorders where I removed the head joint because I didn't, they're kids. Like sometimes I forget my lunch at home and I'm 40 years old for goodness sake. Like it took, and it took me a while to get to that part because I was like, oh, you know, you got to have this and you got to have that. Why? <laughs> you know, they're eight, they're nine, they're 10. So um, some students uh, would purchase two recorders. Um, sometimes I would purchase two recorders for the students who really I know wanted them, but you know, right? Like I just, I, I purchased recorders for students if they needed them. Um, and if they forgot, I took the top, John, can you take the, I took the top joint off. And so what they did is instead of being able to play the recorder in the classroom, they sang and fingered while the class played. That's how I handled it. I also heard from a teacher, I like this idea a lot. I did not do this, but if I went back to the classroom, I would do this. The students left their recorders in the classroom and she had a bucket with that class's yep. recorders. They wrote their name on it. And when they came in, she put the bucket out and she said, come get your recorder. You know, cause they do leave them at home and they're, they're not gonna practice them at home. I mean, we wish they would, but they're not. Uh, actually they do. <laughs> Sometimes oh, okay, do. all right, all right, um, all right, all right. Yes, the so, that I taught many did. So it's another option. I'm just, there are many options. I like the idea of the bucket in the classroom and then they just come and get their their, their thing. And the, the, the teacher would have a set of student books also so that they could say, come grab your recorder and here are the, here are the books, turn to page 15 because we're ready to read. Uh, they've already gone through the oral preparation stages. So the recorder, yes. I, I like your idea too, if they can afford to, but I, the schools I taught in, the kids could barely afford one. And I had to raise money to buy some of them. So I just let them keep them in the classroom. And this was the bucket for this class. And this was the bucket for that class. And this was the bucket for that class. One important thing just to mention is the student books come with a code. So first of all, all of the audio tracks are available to anyone at any time with or without a book. That's but true. the student book also includes a code that will uh, is a unique code for each book that will allow the students to access a digital version and the teacher as well if they wanted of the book. So, uh, so if you get the package, which is a teacher's book and a student book, you will also get an, a, a, an e version of the student books, which you can use for projecting your classroom and those sorts of things. Fantastic. Um, okay, so what? Uh, let's see. There is a question about. Uh, about note names versus solfege. Do you, how do you integrate the note names versus the solfege names? In the regular conversational solfege books, we make that connection. Um, and we, as we talk about, uh, it can be an F or G, that's when we introduce the, the note names. Now, uh, uh, now do is F, now do is G. Uh, so we do introduce the letter names along with the solfege. So do you use chairs and music stands or do you have students just on the floor? I don't have time for that. I'm sorry. That was that was my opinion really strongly. Wow, that just came out there. I, <laughs> I never I don't want chairs in my classroom or music stands because we move so much. In fact, I also have the students move uh, while they play recorder, which is something I learned from the great Tossie Aaron. Um, and I, I just, you know, and I don't spend all time, all the whole time on recorder. So, you know, I don't want to have chairs and stands in the way of folk dancing or creative movement or, or you know, doing an orf extension. I, I, I have them sit on the floor and sometimes they have great posture and sometimes they don't, but just remember their bodies are still developing and it takes a lot of core strength to sit tall, crisscross applesauce on the floor. So be patient with them if they don't have like adult posture. I know we're getting uh, just going to go for a couple more minutes. Sure. What is your vision for conversational recorder applying to other instrumental music instruction? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it, the, well, here's my vision. <laughs> uh, the recorder book already is already ideally suited for xylophones. So I think it would be a perfect extension into xylophones. And the keys are F and G, which works well for xylophones for the most part. And you can always put the F sharp in when you need it later on. Um, 
I also taught uh, Suzuki string students for seven years and I applied this to string lessons and guitar and it was magic. Uh, it's the keys. The only difference is the keys. You have to decide which keys work better for strings. So for strings, you do D, A, and G. For guitar, you do G, C, and D. Um, and ukulele would be the same. Uh, all, really, any instrument could follow this process of sound before sight. You can teach how to play just about any instrument uh, using the first five steps where they learn to play by ear and then say, and by the way, it looks like this. The only thing that you have to do is pick the keys that are appropriate to the instrument. So I, I, cause Meg, I see this ukulele. Yes. And here's the thing, the F chord and the C chord are two of the easiest chords to play on the ukulele. And so with the undergraduates, I just took them through as if I was using this with them and I had them pick the melodies in do, re, mi, do, re, mi, sol, do, re, mi, la, or we strummed on the rhythm patterns and they had said they hadn't played ukulele before and they had a lot of success with it. So I really think the principles of this definitely apply easily to ukulele. Yeah. And for I those think... of you who are like, I sorry, I can't play recorder. I, during uh, the pandemic, um, I don't know where my recorder is. I guess I left it in the class. I'm teaching, so my recorder is somewhere. If you have a, have the kids <laughs> have a t-shirt, thank you, and a hair tie or a rubber band, you stick the recorder in the neck of the shirt, and you wrap it around the 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 hole at the top. It doesn't interfere with the sound too much. You tie it off. You stick your left hand in this arm <laughs> and your right hand in this arm, and they can play the recorder because the aerosols are going to get caught in the shirt. So I, this is how my brain works, but that you can with a t-shirt and a rubber band, you can play recorder. <laughs> <laughs> I think, so, you know, Alec, to answer that question, I think we'll wait to see how people respond to the recorder book. And if the process works well, we'll go forward and do other instruments as well. So uh, last questions at the end, uh, they just want to know how does the conversation recorder, how do you place it within the conversational soul fetish curriculum? And can you also just do it on its own, independent of? Do you want me to answer or do you want to answer, Rachel? Um, for me, it was a natural extension of conversational solfege. Um, but I also have respect for the fact that, you know, other people have different passions and, and, and teach in different ways. And when we piloted the book, uh, teachers who did, who didn't use conversational solfege used the book and they said that they found great success with it as well. Um, though I had a teacher, two teachers who used music learning theory piloted the book, two teachers who I knew only focused on org pedagogy used the book, as well as um, seven other teachers, the seven uh, other teachers, no, six other teachers, sorry, it's been a while since we piloted it, um, were conversational solfege teachers. And all of the feedback was, wow, I hadn't anticipated yeah. thinking about teaching recorder this way, and it really worked for the students. So for me, it was a natural outcome because I am a firm believer of sound before sight. I mean, I found John's, I met John when my first year teaching at conference and I was so excited. I ran down and bought all the books, went back to my classroom and was like, oh wait, how do I teach this again? And so I taught it badly for a couple of years until I got my master's and I was lucky enough to get my master's with John. And then I was like, oh, and so I went back to the classroom and it just, I didn't, I wasn't working as hard and it was just, the kids were having fun and it was like every, they were learning while just playing. And the principal would be like, it just looks like y'all are playing. Let me tell you about it. And it really does mirror language learning. It truly, truly mirrors language learning. And for me, it was a natural extension. So yes, you can, because other teachers have done it without doing conversational solfege. I just think it's a natural outcome of the method. I agree. If you're already teaching conversational solfege, this will make total sense. And if you're not teaching conversational solfege, you will discover the excitement of teaching sound before sight and teaching how to play by ear before you introduce the notation. You'll discover it and you might even become interested in conversational solfege. Great. Thank you both so much. We really appreciate the insights. We will be, this is recorded. We will be placing it on YouTube in the next couple of days. Keep your eye open on our Facebook page for links, and we'll send an e-blast out as well. Thank you all so much. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rachel. 
Have a wonderful day, everyone. Happy 4th. Take care. Thank you. Happy 4th. Thank you.